We start promptly, okay? People will be late, but too bad. The idea about this is that we make it as informal as possible. We just capture the staff for one hour, uh, and no selfies afterwards, no presentation, no nothing. So I, I only came here for a selfie with <laughs> David Tang. But. And um, the idea also is is not China exchange, but it's China exchange. The idea is that I think if you try to sell China you won't get very many younger generation and the public to come because generally China is not sold in a, a sexy enough way, not in the world today. So what I try to do is to get people and <coughs> emphasize excellence first. So we have exceptional people who are hugely successful in their fields. And if they have some direct or indirect um, relations or references to China, all the better. And you'll be surprised to know that out of all the speakers we've had so far, every single one of them, including Carlos Acosta, who is a Cuban uh, and is a ballet dancer in London, can relate to China because in China, there are also many people, very young people who live in destitution, who also want to aspire to a star. And Jacob Rothschild was mobbed because everybody wanted to know how he has managed to maintain eight generations of Rothschilds and influence and wealth. Um, and uh, they wanted to know the secret. And in fact, he told us the secret. It was incest and uh, a bit of luck. They all intermarried and they ganged together. Um, so um, there it is. Now, we are particularly pleased. So first of all, can you please join me to welcome Eric Fellner today? <laughs> I will tell you, it's very difficult to capture Eric Fellner. And now we want to capture him just for an hour. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, ask Eric to say a few words and introduce you, perhaps, to a film on working title, which, uh, of which, of course, he's responsible, and uh, to give you a flavor of what he has done, which is a great deal. One minute. So, Eric, do you want to say a couple of things first? I just want to say what he said, um, which is this will give you a flavor of what we've done. So, um, let's on. see it. Can we switch off the no, two not lights? That, not that, not that, not oh, that. Okay. Don't worry. Hopefully it works. If you do 
them. As your friend, I want to help you die with dignity. More powerful than even the fear of death itself is the will to work. Give me the CD, you must the money, Dick Watt. Miss any big star? Any what? Big star. I think they've all there. There's, yeah, there's some others, but I mean, there it is. I mean, you saw everything that's on the screen, which, in fact, is a product of Eric. So, tell us how you managed all this. Oh my God. Well, first of all, I love the idea that it's a product of me. But to make a movie, as a lot of you know, who are involved in the business or know people who are, it takes a not just a village but a city to make a movie. And uh, the producer's role is kind of like the, uh, the, the conductor or the, the chief executive or, um, you know, the person trying to make sure that everybody is in the right place at the right time, creatively, financially, s specifically, you know, in, in, in any, any of the various um, uh, arts and uh, um, technical areas. Um, from beginning to the very end. So when I watch that, it's like, uh, you know, that's 30 years, 100 movies, which there's not all in there, but um, it's an extraordinary amount of uh, people who have been involved in all of our films. And the one thing you see from that is that, if you know your movies, is there's quite a few people who we've worked with over and over and over again. And having that ability to create a creative family um, is a it's a it's a wonderful thing because it, it shortcuts all of these complicated relationships that you need to make with people, um, and it means that you can you can build on on the film that you made into another one, another one, another one. Um, so that, that that that's also something I'm quite proud of. Not only the films, the people we work with, but all of those talented people who are part of the working title family. But presumably there was a humble beginning. There was me running around these streets trying to persuade people to give me a job, yeah. <laughs> what was, I mean, what was the first film you produced? Uh, the first, well, I, uh, before films, I did music videos in the early 80s, pre, there's a lot of very young people, especially in the front row, um, who um, may not <laughs> remember, <laughs> may not remember that there was a time before MTV. Um, and in those years before MTV, I was working as a, a runner and a, a kind of a, go for making music videos. And then suddenly MTV happened, and I was 18, 19 at the time, and there was just like this explosion of a, a new business, which was the music business world. It was a bit like in 2000 when the internet suddenly hit, you know, it's just, there were no rules, you could do whatever you wanted. And back in those times, um, the unions were very, very powerful. Um, you have to be very old to remember that. Um, and uh, if you wanted to be in the film business, you couldn't get into the film business without being a member of the union, and you couldn't get into the union without having a job. So there was this crazy situation where you just could not enter the industry. And music videos didn't come under the, the union um, rulings. So suddenly there were opportunities for young people like me to, to make a career in that world. And so I did three years of music videos working for you know, making videos for all the biggest stars in the world then and traveling all over the world. Um, and it was amazing. I was 19, 20, doing all this stuff. It was great. And then by the time I got to 23, 24, I could not take another person strumming a guitar, <laughs> miming into a microphone. Um, and I just had to, uh, I had to do something different. And knowing nothing about films at all, I just printed a new business card and, and said, film producer, struck off the video bit, 
and uh, decided to go and try and work out how to move my skills of producing music videos into film. And I met a crazy guy called Alex Cox, who had made a film called Repo Man that was a brilliant independent movie out of America. And he'd written this script about Sid Vicious and his girlfriend, Nancy Spungen. And coming from the music world and having grown up in the 70s on the King's Road with my punk haircut, which you sadly never got to see, Tang, um, it was the story that I just desperately wanted to make into a film. And it was called Sid and Nancy. And um, I got it made. I don't know how I got it made. I knew nothing about making films. I just, you know, I had this, I was 24, and when you're 24, you can do anything. And I was going to make this film. And I got the money together. I got all the talent together. Got the director to do it. You know, we, we, uh, we made the movie. Then it Did Sid there. Vicious actually star in it? Sid Vicious was six feet under at that point. So. Oh, right. Well, um, sadly, but who played him? Uh, Gary Oldman. It was ah. Gary Oldman's first um, major role. And, uh, yeah, it was good fun. And uh, that made money? Well, it didn't make... It made a little bit of money, but in those days, the, the British film industry, because we're going to talk a little bit about how, how you go from making films here in the UK to trying to make films that, that travel. Um, the British film industry in those days was very insular. It was very much that one would make a movie specifically for the UK market, and if it traveled, that was a plus. Um, when I say travel, I mean you know, played in, in, in all the international territories around the world. But we were very inward-looking, not outward-looking as, as an industry. And there'd been very, very few major hit British movies. You know, the David Lean movies, uh, the Bond movies, um, you know, the Carry On movies. I mean, th these were films that, that, actually Carry On was pretty much Australia and the UK, but, but the David Lean movies and uh, uh, Bond movies were big hits elsewhere. So um, the, the, the goal was to just try and get some recognition. And we got accepted into the Cannes Film Festival with the film. And we went down to France and uh, the day of the screening, Turned up at, um, sorry, that was embarrassing. Um, turned up at the uh, screening on the Palais in, in Cannes, right on the, uh, uh, the front there. And there were riot police everywhere. And I thought, oh, that's weird. I wonder what's going on. And it turned out that a thousand punks from Paris had descended on uh, <laughs> the Cannes Film Festival and had smashed everything. They had smashed up all the windows to the all the glass doors to the palais, the whole thing, the riot police were there, there was tear gas and everything. It was just brilliant. Um, <laughs> I was like, okay, I love the film business. So that was how I got a bit of recognition from my first Well, that movie. was a bit of luck. That was yeah. a bit of luck. It, you know, nowadays, you'd hire Matthew Freud and orchestrate that. Um, <laughs> in, in those days without internet, it just happened uh, holistically. Yeah. Um, but after that, uh, obviously, there must have been another break which propelled you uh, to the forefront. Uh, was it Four Weddings and a Funeral? Yeah. I mean, what happened between then, that was uh, 85. So between 85 and, and 94, um, I made a lot of films on an independent basis, some in America, some here. Um, but it was always, always operating in a very hand-to-mouth um, basis where you're just trying to put together a film, try to get paid, try and make sure that the film is as good as it possibly can be. But the business of film finance was and is so complicated that 90% of the producer's time was spent working on the financing. You never really got to spend a lot of time working on making the film as good as it possibly could be. And in 1991, I teamed up with my current partner, a chap called Tim Bevan, and a guy called Michael Kuhn, who had just persuaded Polygram Records to uh, start spending a lot of money in the film business. And what he realized was that if you built a, a distribution network of um, operations around the world, and then you fed them product, you were, sorry, films, shouldn't use the word product, um, if you feed them films and put them into your own distribution network, not only will those films be distributed better, but if they're successful, you get to keep the money. The money comes back to the people that made the movies. And so with a big influx of capital from Polygram, he set up distribution operation in Germany, France, Australia, uh, UK, and then eventually America. And <coughs> it meant that Every film we started to make from that moment on, we didn't have to worry about the money. The minute that Polygram 
said they're making the film. Our job then was to make the film as good as possible. And it was an incredibly freeing process where, yes, you had to work really hard to get the film greenlit in the first place, but then you just worked closely with everybody to make sure it worked well, uh, it got made well, and then you could spend a lot of time on marketing and, and distribution and uh, dating the movie. For those that aren't in the industry, uh, when you come into the business, you think that the holy grail is to make a good film. Sadly, that is not the case. Of course, you want to make a good film, but without great marketing and great distribution, even a good film can do no business whatsoever. And it's a, it's a, it's a truth that takes a lot of failure to learn. Um, and it's not until you have a good film that then has good distribution and, and marketing and is successful that you realize this is what it's all about. So just to quickly finish that trail, uh, Four Weddings was the first time we had that. So in 94, we made Four Weddings. And when we made it, we made it for nothing, two and a half million pounds. Uh, we thought it would be a bit of a hit in the UK and Australia and be a bonus if it did any business anywhere else. And uh, it went on to do $280 million at the box office, another $250 million in uh, uh, DVD and, and TV sales. And we saw very clearly the power of how our marketing operation and our distribution operation with Polygram forced that film, sorry, I got a dreadful cold, um, forced that film into not only being successful, but being very successful. And then you look at the business of it, and you see that in all the territories, the countries where we had direct distribution, all the money came back to the financiers and the producers and the creative talent. And all, all the territories where we'd licensed it, nothing came back, even on a film that size. And it was a very, very clear lesson that we had to work within a distribution system where you had global, a global network. And otherwise, as an independent producer, the odds are so stacked against you. And that's why our British film industry has so few successful producers, because it's just impossible for them to build a business. And um, look, I don't want to hog this uh, because I've invited you all to come and uh, ask him questions. I'm sure that all of you will be uh, asking Eric intelligent questions. And all I ask is that it be an intelligent question. So this is as good a time as any for you to go and ask Eric uh, all sorts of questions. Not, not, not that I ever want to disagree with David Tang. But, <laughs> um, I thought it would be interesting because I've never worked in China. And given this is the China exchange, I thought it would be interesting to Yes, but why don't you do that yeah, first? To yeah, bring, sorry, a, to to bring a few facts to the table that I wish I could just reel them off and pretend that I knew everything about the Chinese market, but I don't. I cribbed, and I spoke to our colleagues at Universal who do distribute in, uh, in China. And I thought it would just be fascinating to get a sense of what the scale of the market is in China. Now, all of you probably know that in America there's 350 million people in the uh, European Union. 250. To, well, it's, it's, I think it's, yeah, America, you're right. America, 350? Yeah, it's no, two, I think it's, anyway, it's between 250 and 350. The difference... 350. Is, yeah, but it's kind of irrelevant when you talk about China because they have 1.4 billion people. Um, so the potential marketplace is enormous. Europe has 300, I think, 375, something like that. I'm looking at you like you're an expert. But, um, so, you know, the, even the two biggest markets um, in the Western world put together is only half of China. I mean, it's quite stunning. So. Ten years ago, there were hardly any screens in China. And the way which we operate in a theatrical film industry is you've got to put films on the screen. And in the last um, ten years, um, there are now, they've built enormous amounts of screens. There's now 27,000 screens. You compare that to America, where there's 38,000 now. America, 350 million, 38,000. China, 1.4 billion. 27,000, you can see where this is going. There are going to be 60, 70,000 within the next 10, 15 years. Um, and once you've got that many screens, the business that films are going to be able to do is unbelievable. This is a chart just of uh, what's been happening recently, and you'll recognize the names of the top films. The top films are the few American films that are allowed to be distributed in China. The way the Chinese market works is kind of interesting. It's a bit like France. Um, where they do have a system that is set up to try and protect and create their own indigenous industry, which I think is a brilliant thing. Because if they didn't have that, Hollywood would just rush in 
um, everyone would just be going to Hollywood movies. And I think what, far be it for me to say, but I think what would be great is for, and they are doing it actually, the Chinese um, filmmakers are really, really spending a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of effort in bringing their industry up to the same level as Hollywood. Um, so every year, 34 films can be distributed in China, 34 English language films. They can come from, actually 34 foreign films. They can come from anywhere. The bulk of them, because of the power of the Hollywood majors, comes from the studios. And then a few come from England, a few from France, a few, but very few sophisticated films. It's nearly always genre-oriented, it's nearly always 3D, it's nearly always IMAX, and it's nearly always, as you can see here, action. Um, so this is the top five films of all time in, in, America, in, uh, in China of the Americans. Uh, Fast and Furious, you know, it's still on screens now. It's done 390, just to give you some form of reference. In America, it's a monster hit, and it's done 320. So China is now a bigger market than America, which nobody would have predicted that in the last few years. Um, these films at the top end are getting a bit geeky, so stop me if I, if I bore you. Um, but these films at the top end, the 390, 318, 216, those compared to in America. If in America you wanted to do, uh, let's say, you know, a $300 million box office, you would need to spend on marketing about 60 or $70 million. In China, to do those kind of numbers, you spend four or $5 million. So the costs of getting these massive box office numbers are just disproportionately different. Um, so you'd think immediately China is therefore way more profitable. Sadly, the Chinese cleverly are there ahead of us on that thought process, and they take the bulk of the box office. Um, so it's something like an 80-20 split, whereas in the US, and that's in their favor, in the US it's a 50-50 split, or uh, you know maybe 45-55. Um, but you know, it's still substantial sums of money that you can make in China. And then the interesting thing on the bottom five is that the Chinese market is starting to catch up very quickly. You know, they're of the top five films and they're grossing, you know, on way, way, way less production budget. I mean, any of those films on the top probably all cost 200 million to make. I'll bet you, I don't know the specifics of any of the ones on the bottom, but I bet you none of them cost more than 15 or 20 to make, million dollars that is. So the economics for a local Chinese producer who gets a bigger share of the box office than the American producer would get is really exciting. And they're building, China are building you know, huge amounts of studios, their training infrastructure. You know, it's going to be a brilliant, brilliant marketplace um, over the next decade or so. Uh, other interesting facts are there's no censorship. Uh, sorry, there's no rating system. There is censorship. So... Um, no film, every film that goes out is just an all audiences film. So as such, anything that is English language that's quite racy or hard hitting or complicated or it just doesn't make the cut. Um, if it is those things and the Chinese authorities decide they do want it to run on screens, they just edit the hell out of it. So your film could literally be unrecognizable. You have no control over what the final film looks like. Um, Piracy is a huge issue. When we release a film anywhere in the world, we make money from, we generate revenue from four or five different sources. First is in the cinemas, then with DVD, then with, um, well at the same time now, electronic sell-through, which is Apple, you know, iTunes, those kind of things. Then you have satellite TV, then you have free TV, then you have you know, all these other layers of TV. So you're constantly making, re generating revenue from all these different layers of, uh, of income. In China, at the moment, there's one, and that's theatrical. Everything else is basically free or you, 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 you can't generate any money. The things will change once um, a uh, electronic sell-through, which is effectively what we call iTunes, is developed and there's a payment system that works simply and the audience becomes uh, comfortable with doing it like that. But at the moment, piracy just kills all of those ancillary uh, markets. So it's quite tough as a um, financial center to make money in China still. But as I say, things are changing and will get better. Um, that's about it. Well, I mean, that's an incredible um, insight. 
latest. So um, inadvertently, as I told you, predicted, that in fact, when you're not expecting somebody to talk about China, here it is, Eric Fellner has become an instant expert. Yeah, okay, so. now anybody has got an intelligent question to ask Eric? Yes, and then, and then wrap it, yeah. Just, just speak on the, Eric. Oh, thank you. Um, what an amazing video to, to watch with all the success. So I guess the question is, how do you identify a good film, a good product, is not only the, the story, but the whole package, which you talk about family. And maybe on the other side, you could give us an example of one that looked like, but failed, and maybe for which reasons? Yeah, okay, that, that's actually, um, it's a great question. And I wish I had the absolute answer, because ultimately, all, all, all I have is my opinion. Um, but my opinion after making 100 movies, and more importantly, probably not making 10,000 movies, is very, very informed. And the informed nature of it can protect you from getting hurt, but it can't protect you from making the wrong decision. And there will always be times when I'll make a decision on a movie and the movie will fail. And that's just life. It's, um, you know, it is, it's called, it, it's a, it's a hit-driven business, this. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen Entourage, um, but there's an agent in Entourage called Ari Gold, and he's based on a real-life guy called Ari Emanuel. And his, uh, his answer to your question is, hits work. And it's a very annoying answer, but the truth is, you make something that's good and it's a hit, it works. And that's all there is to it. So backing up a bit from that, how do you identify what could be a hit? First thing that I try and do is identify what is the movie's audience? What potentially is this movie's audience? So you've got to start with a bit of passion. You read the script or you look at the materials or you think about an idea. You've got to get excited and passionate and believe that it's something you want to do. So let's say you get over that hurdle. Then you've got to think, well, who's the audience for this film? Are people really going? And you mustn't get into the, um, uh, well, I, all young producers do it. They believe if they love it, everyone's going to love it. You have to bring a sense of real scrutiny and examination into your market. And so you've got to think, okay, look, you look at comps, you look at, well, they've gone, you look at charts, you try and identify this type of film, da, 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 da. And it's not scientific, but it's informed. So then you think, okay, I'm making a really fascinating, brilliant story, but it's an art house movie. It's only going to get a very limited audience. At that point, you think, can I make it for $10, $15 million or less? And if the answer is no, you stop right there. Or if you're making a mainstream movie and you think that you can get a four quadrant you know, young women, young men, old women, old men, um, family movie, and um, you really believe that it is commercial and you really believe that it's going to get that big audience. You don't want to spend too little on it because you want to make sure that you are spending enough to give that sophisticated audience who see films at two, three hundred million dollars enough bang for their buck that they're going to enjoy it when it's done. So that's like the preliminary process. And then you just kind of go from there. What kind of stars can I put in the movie to make sure that it's going to be marketable? What kind of director can I get to make sure they're not going to make a crap film? Um, you know, when should I release it? Is there a date available? You know, and then we get into all the really nerdy, geeky stuff. But it's all of these processes. So the idea that a film producer just goes, this is brilliant, I'm going to make it, you know, those days are gone. And anyone who does do that is either a genius or an idiot. And I haven't met. Many. Well, you're not, you must be a genius then. No, 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 I'm not. not. I go genius. through all this thing. I go through it, I re-examine, I re So re let's go through the theory of everything. So when it was first presented to you, let's just apply that through your um, okay. processes. So what did you think and why did you think he was going to be popular when he's about a, a deformed physicist? Uh, and Disabled, was there, David. Uh, all right, okay. <laughs> Disabled. Um, challenged. We'll, we'll carry him through the race. <laughs> <laughs> Physically challenged. Sorry. Sorry, Stephen. <laughs> um, so let's try to put that okay. through your process. All right. Um, we can do that one, or we could do three others that are equally well known, which are Billy Elliot, um, Four Weddings and a Funeral, and uh, one other one which are all on the page, unlikely hits. So the first thing that happens is I, my passion comes. So I read that screenplay and I go, wow, this is an amazing story. And it, I cry, the hairs on my back of my neck go, you know, all the little indicators we people who enjoy this kind of stuff have. And you go, okay, this could be great. This could be really good. Then immediately I come to a screeching halt thinking, 
there's no audience for this film. No one is going to go and see a guy who's predominantly in a wheelchair, um, who has a life-threatening disease, and, you know, this is too tough. Um, and then I think, well, maybe it's Stephen Hawking. You know, we have, it's Jane Hawking, Stephen Hawking. He's one of the most famous people in the world. So us film people, we really want, especially in this day and age, we want marketable hooks. We want something we can spit it out to you guys, and immediately you'll have gone, oh, I know that, or oh, that sounds interesting, or, you know, in 10 seconds. You guys have no attention span, and that's the problem for us making good films. And because you have no attention span, we have to somehow grab you really quickly. So if I say Stephen Hawking and his wife, immediately people go, oh, okay. So because it was about someone, if it had been about just any old you know, person in that situation, I would have just put the script down and moved on. That's and because of his book more than anything else. It's because he's a renowned physicist. He's known globally. He's, you know, if you do... Um, I think he's known globally because of the book, which is the most unread book, uh, which has so most copies in the world. Uh, but, I mean, nobody would have known him as a physicist, but the brief history of time uh, was a hit. That, <coughs> that, was, that was monumental. But anyway, you make the point that he was famous. Yeah, so, you, so I then thought, okay, I've got, got something I can market this on. All right, so let's, let's make it for as little money as possible. So you then set a very low budget, and in this case it was $15 million. And then it's like, okay, I need a great director and I need um, fantastic stars. And uh, we took a punt. And I know that if I make a film at $15 million, working with, going back to what I was saying about having a global network of distribution, if I put it through the Universal Studios system, who are our, Universal are our partners, we, prefer, we try and make all of our films with Universal. I know that if I put that through the system at that price, that we're not going to get hurt too much if we've got a good film. It doesn't have to be a great film. And the reason I know that is that studios all have a series of output deals for television. They have... Um, they have the power to drive DVD sales. You may not notice it, but very subtly, whenever you go into the petrol station or WH Smith, or there's certain films that are always at the front of the desk, at the, and that's because the studios have the power in the marketplace to get what we call what we used to call it shelf space. They even now call it that on iTunes, and it's getting those films through. If you make it independently, you're fighting a losing battle because you cannot get into all of these places. So I know that a $15 million movie that's pretty good. You know, the worst that's going to happen, you're going to lose $5 million. You're not going to lose a lot of money. You probably will break even. So at this point, you're kind of thinking, okay, we've got partners of a studio. They want to do it. I, I'm passionate about the material. I've got really good talent attached. We're going to press the button and green light the film. Little did I know that the director and the two actors were going to make the best version of the film you could ever possibly make. Um, and uh, as such, it went on to do $130 million globally. Eddie won the Oscar. He got nominated for four Oscars. Eddie won the BAFTA. Eddie won SAG. You know, and it's become one of those films. Um, and the studio have made substantial, the financier have made a substantial sum of money. And everyone comes away happy. The audience are happy. We're happy. And it's an unlikely hit. But I had an insurance policy. I knew that if I pushed the button, no one would get hurt too much. The other one I'd love to talk about, I know I'm banging on a bit, but Billy oh, Elliot. Yeah. Have you have people seen Billy Elliot? Um, Billy Elliot, there is no reason Billy Elliot should ever have been made. Um, it was about a minor, a mining community. Frankly, most people in the world didn't care about that. It was about a kid who wanted to be a ballet dancer. Nobody really didn't care about that. There was no opportunity to put a star in the film, so there was no way to market it. It was a first-time film director, and it just should not have happened. And it happened because my partner and I, Tim Bevan, we read the script, and um, we were reduced to tears, and we were moved in ways that very few written words can move you. And we both just said afterwards, you know what? It is our duty to make this film. This is an incredible story, and we can make it really cheap, and we have to leverage what we've achieved in the industry. And fortunately, because of that reel, I'm able to take a few risks. People will come along with me to take some risks that they might not otherwise take. And uh, we need to leverage our position, get this movie made. So we make the movie. It, we made it for, I think we made two and a half million dollars, pounds, I can't remember which. Um, it did $120 million uh, global box office. But more interestingly, we then took it on to be a, um, 
a musical that is played globally. We just celebrated our 10th anniversary of the musical on the West End two nights ago. It's played to 10 million people. It's grossed around $650 million. Um, and this tiny little story that speaks to people's hearts and speaks to people's minds in a way that very few works can, whatever culture they're from, what other, whatever language they speak, has affected people on a global basis and been hugely successful. And it makes me, that's why I'm a film producer, the, the, the privilege of being able to do things like that and take risks on, on artistic and often ultimately cultural endeavors that then also produce financial rewards too is, is why I do it. But you transgressed on step two, namely, I love it, I cry, Tim cries, but does yeah. anybody really care? No, not really. So how, how, how can you explain? Just because we felt at this price, we have to take that risk. Oh, really? so we, yeah, we just two and a half to. million, yeah. okay. Yeah. To take a if it had been 25, there's no way we would have made it. Anyway, it's a very long winded to answer to your question. Uh, one minute. Um, 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 yeah, Rafi. Yeah, it's a question for maybe both of you. Uh, going back to China, no. does, uh, does uh, the Chinese government encourage people like you to give gives you any breaks to make films in China, like Eastern European countries used to? Or I don't know if they still do now. But does the Chinese government do that or not? Um, I didn't research that. So I don't know the answer, but I, will I tell think... You, I will tell you no, not Yeah, foreigners. I think it's no. For, for two very simple reasons. They don't know the content. They're not, you know, they, they don't know what the end result is. So nobody's going to take the rap and say, okay, fine, you can do it. Even if they scrutinize the script, you can shove in a nudity scene or a, something obscene and so forth. And what the man who gives the okay will never take that risk because his, his career is on the line. And secondly, uh, the point is that they know that when they come to China, labor is cheap. So they don't want to be exploited. So I, I think that for those reasons alone, um, yeah, the, 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 it hasn't happened anyway. The production costs are substantially lower. So in effect, as, as David says, you're, you're kind of getting a, a built-in subsidy through the fact that um, uh, everything is, is a lot cheaper. There was, a, there was an exception, uh, Last Emperor, Bertolucci. I mean, when I was living in Beijing, that film was shot. And I saw Bertolucci every day filming at the Forbidden City uh, and the Summer Palace. And when I was teaching at Peking University, I, I saw him every day we had barbecue and so forth. And I was absolutely astonished that the Chinese authorities allow that to happen. But that was a one-off. I mean, I've never seen another e example of that. Right, okay, Let, let's have a woman first. <coughs> a lady. A lady, sorry. God, you um, can't take him anywhere. Um, <laughs> number one, just what A perfectly say. formed lady. Thank you so much, my goodness. A beautiful um, lady. Lord, no, I've now you're over a question yet. in a second. Um, number one, thank you very much. What a find coming to these talks are. Um, and you know, maybe it needs to be bigger, well, m better marketed, that more people discover the treat. We want quality, treat. not quantity. Um, <laughs> I, until recently, worked for Warner Brothers, and so sort of have a, a small insight into um, some of the decisions that Warner Brothers have been making in terms of scripts and sort of making them very amenable to the exploding, exciting Chinese market. And our Chinese colleagues quite often in big meetings would talk about changing nationalities of characters within scripts, you know, when we had the luck to read them early. And I just wondered, from your perspective, have you got any funny anecdotes as to sort of, you know, decisions being made when you're talking about tailoring to your four quadrant exploding audience as to whether there's any, we can look forward to, you know, Billy Elliot from a Chinese perspective of, you know, a rice village. As yeah, I mean, we're, we're constantly being approached by Chinese producers to make Bridget Jones, Notting Hill, About Time, uh, not Billy Elliot yet, they haven't asked us to do that. Um, and we are actually starting to have conversations about maybe doing some of them in, uh, uh, in China, in, in local language, with local stars. And I'm expecting all of those conversations to start to occur. Um, uh, in terms of us, we, I've never yet tried to make a film in China, so I don't have any, any of that stuff. I mean, we've, we've had situations in India where is it okay to talk about India? Yes, I mean, um, that's another 1.3 billion yeah. uh, people. I mean, where, why, how, how do you, do you have statistics for that? I, mean, I don't know any statistics. Well, actually, the statistics for that are really not good. 
because the price of admission in, in India is nothing. So even though there's a lot of people, you will know this, there's a lot of people going to the movies in, in, in India, but you can't generate any revenue because the well, ticket prices are so, are so cheap. Yeah. Whereas in China, the ticket prices are, are higher. Um, but in India, we were going to do a film um, all about partition. And boy, did we get censored to hell in that. And ultimately, we decided, well, we can't make the film because it's just what they want is not what happened. So <laughs> we'd be killed. Um, so that didn't work. Um, but you've worked for a studio. I mean, you know what it's like. It's, uh, you know, I'm slightly different because Tim and I, working title, we have one foot in independent filmmaking and one foot in studio filmmaking. We have the best, I think, situation possible where we really care about making a great film that has fantastic stories, fantastic characters, and real narrative drive. And we also want to make money. We want to generate business. The most exciting thing for me is when I make a film and the cinema is full of people enjoying it. You know, that, that's, that's what it's about. So to make an independent movie that no one goes to, I don't want to do that, I can't be bothered anymore. But the studios, you know, yeah, they will go, well, Angelina Jolie can play this rather than, you know, Russell Crowe, let's make it a woman, or let's do this, or let's do that. Or, you know, there, there's, there's, it's a different approach, and both have their merits, and, you know, the truth is the studios are doing brilliantly at the moment. They're making huge mainstream movies, big tent poles, that are, you know, I mean, in the last month there's been two films that have already crossed 300 million in the box office. One film that's just done 1.4 billion, Fast What's and that? Furious 7. Oh, yes. um, and Avengers is going to do, you know, way over a billion. Um, you know, that is a real, you know, they're, they're, not, they're not starting from the, the, the creative, they're starting very much from a marketable, a marketable proposition. Um, All right, next question. Yes. Um, the gentleman and then the lady. See. Thank you very much, Eric, for uh, bringing us into your world of the film industry. Um, By the way, there are two more excerpts, so we mustn't forget that. Oh, yeah, we're going to allow sure. time. One, uh, the two new films <coughs> coming up. So after this and your question, we're going to play another. He's uh, so bossy, isn't he? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> if I was you, I'd just ignore him. Yeah. Yeah. Um, We've got very little time. I promised him to deliver him out of seven. Right. No, I'm all right for a bit more. My question is a product of all the other questions somehow. Um, it is related to a most recent event with uh, the movie The Interview. The movie? Uh, the Interview? Oh, the Interview, yeah. Uh, with North Korea? Yeah. Um, my, my, my thoughts are, do we, where do we draw the line between freedom of expression and um, a government, you know, state team, uh, this, this movie should not be released? Do you think the film industry in general has learned something from this experience? If, if a repeated situation would occur again, or it made us even stronger in terms of, no, we won't be, let's say, um, influenced in, by threats? Or I think you draw the line wherever you want to draw the line. I think that is the truth, and I'll draw it where I want to draw it, and everyone else will draw it where they want to draw it. Um, in terms of this situation, I mean, this was pretty brutal. Um, whether it was North Korea or not, we'll never actually know. You know, the signs make it look like it was. Um, was it a good or bad decision to make that film using a living leader? Again, some people will say yes, some will say no. Could have been done either which way. Um, did the industry respond positively and properly to the potential threat to the First Amendment? Is it the First Amendment? I think it is. Uh, no, it was very poor. It was very disjointed, and Sony were left to hang out in the dry, to hang out in the hang out too dry. Um, and uh, ultimately, you would have turned it down straight away, would you? It's not for me to say what I would or wouldn't have done. Um, <laughs> Or whether I would have made it like that, um, I, I, you know, I think it's it's 50-50. I mean, the we live in a really complex world now, where a lot of corporate decisions go way beyond the decision themselves. And um, you know, what we mustn't forget is that what was done, whoever did it, it was a crime. Um, and uh, you can't just go in and steal shit. Um, and that's what they did. Um, it was a terrible film, anyway. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I'm my answer to you is, I think we each draw the line where we want to draw the line. But we should fight to protect free speech. Oh, hi. Um, I have two questions, actually. And the first question is, like, um, 
most of the films in the marketplace, and we see the nationality of the characters, they are very singular. I mean, like, in the film, they are like British, but it's not like very mixed. But the reality is in the cosmopolitan city like London, and we have uh, friends from di different nationalities. So what do you think if it's a, a film and set in the UK, but the leading character is Asian, do you see any potential in that kind of movie? Do you think it will alienate the mainstream audience? If you, the leading you, character you, is the Chinese? Have you Googled, work, have you been looking at our development slate? Oh, sorry? Have you been Googling our development slate? Uh, no, not really. Okay, because we have a project that is exactly that. Um, oh. That we're currently talking about making with Chinese partners. Um, and the lead is a, is a, a Chinese um, actress, actually, she's a movie star. Um, I won't tell you what the story is, but it's exactly that, because we, we're really excited about the idea of merging both cultures and being able to find a way of developing and creating uh, films that both East and West will enjoy, uh, not in a pejorative way. So. Like you look at some of those films, I mean, they're spectacle, they're great, but they actually have nothing to do with the Chinese marketplace. And what I'd like to do is try and make films where there's a little bit of interest and connection in both places. So I think that's the answer to your question. When is it going to come and out? And the answer, well, we got to, we, uh, there's some problems, but we'll get there. <laughs> is it going to be oh, called so a yellow exciting. peril? <laughs> Well, that's so exciting to hear. I'm writing a book at the moment, and maybe we could share some ideas. And my second okay, question. Stop. No, there's not. No, you can't hog the mic. Okay. Oh, the, the, stop. this is no, 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 no. Question. One question. That's it. Okay, we stop. speak later. Uh, grab her microphone. Yes. <laughs> right. Let's have another um, uh, 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 thing. Are you, are you that bored? Come on. There's, no, you no, got no, to. No, no. You got to stop. You know, we'll spread the thing even. One question each. And we've got Nick here. We've got another man there. We've got a. Chinese boy, and then we've got a pretty Burmese woman at the back. Okay, let's have a look at this one. Tell oh, hang on, what, what are we doing? He's running my company already. It's a disaster. Tell us about this one. Uh, oh, Everest. This is um, this is the trailer for a new film we just made called Everest. Can you turn it as loud as it will go? As loud as it will go. Just showing it for fun. Why not? Okay, there's no sound. Can you go back to the beginning? Great, and we kill all the lights. Yeah, okay.
Tragically, it looks rubbish on that monitor. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I, I saw it rubbish. yesterday. Throw um, it away afterwards, all right? I, I saw it Send yesterday. Send another bill to a working title to get a much larger one. I saw it yesterday, 3D IMAX, and it is stunning. All the sounds being cut, all of the, uh, the, the compression on this TV takes all the sound effects and the music, and so I really apologize. Don't judge the film on that. That was bad. Anyway. All right. We can move on. You, you, you ask a question, and then um, Nick. Thank you so and then much. the Chinese, and then the... Um, my question leads on just from your um, observation there about the quality of the film that you've watched. I'd like to ask and pick your brains about the future of filmmaking and um, maybe will uh, or how will uh, the films and the productions that you make change as the viewership, the way that we, all, that we engage with films changes. Perhaps you know, we're going to be streaming more films, we're going to be watching them in more isolation. Is, do you see that as a pattern? Do you see that your productions will change? if the way that we watch them changes. Um, are you a journalist? No, I'm an architect. You're what? I'm an architect. Oh, you're an architect? Yeah. No, I just saw you writing notes, because the, the, oh. the answer will be different if you're about to publish what I'm going to say. <laughs> this is strictly, <laughs> strictly off the record. OK, all right, the, the, cool. So, yeah, thank you. Um, there may be other journalists here. But, um, uh, listen, human beings for 2,000 years have wanted to listen to stories and tell stories and be touched emotionally in some form or another. They want to laugh, they want to cry, and I don't care how many YouTube hits of cats on balls you see, ultimately, you're a human being and you want to see a story, and when a good story comes in front of you, you watch it. It doesn't matter whether you're five or 500. Um, so my belief is that um, full length, hour to two hour storytelling will continue as forever. I don't think that's going to die. Our job as filmmakers is to ensure that we're telling good, good enough stories to warrant people's time, because we know that you all have a lot of other things that you can be doing with your time. How you will consume, I don't really care. If you want to watch it on an iPhone, I'm fine. I'm making it for the cinema, which is why I'm so upset that I showed you that on this. Um, you know, the, the other thing is, that you probably all got flat screen televisions. Do not watch movies on them without changing the settings, because they all get compressed to look like game shows. What, do they, what setting do you need? Well, I, it's, it's different on every television, but you have to go in there and change the crush the black. I mean, it's just a nightmare, these TVs, because they make every film look, look like a game show. I mean, it's just awful, because they compress everything. Anyway, it's a technical issue. Um, but I don't really care how you watch it. I'd rather you go to the cinema. I think that what will happen in the next five, 10 years is that 90% of movies will be available in any form, anywhere, anyhow, the day they come out. Right now, they're only available in the cinema, and then 13 or 14 weeks later, you're, allow you're allowed to watch it you know, at home or through DVD, and then a series of periods after that, you can get it in different forms. I think that will end. The wi that's called Windows, the period between the two things. That, I think, will end. We're one of the last businesses where we spend hundreds of millions. You know, when, when we opened Les Miserables, um, we probably spent over 100 million marketing that film. And yet we wouldn't allow anybody to see it other than in a cinema. Now, if any other product anywhere in the world spent $100 million on marketing a piece of whatever it is, a pair of shoes, or they would try desperately to get you to buy it any way you could buy it. But uh -uh, we don't do that. Um, so we have to change. Um, and then when we change, I don't care how you watch it. Um, I hope you come to the cinema still, because that is where you will get the best experience. But if you want to watch it with, and if any of you watch things with, uh, you know, a, an iP a, a iPad with headphones, the minute you put headphones on, it is immersive automatically. So I would rather watch a film on an iPad with headphones than on a screen like that. Even though that screen's bigger, I don't, I don't get into it. But when you've got an iPad right here with immersive sound, I'm pulled into it. I'd much rather go to the cinema. But, but Les Miserables, did, did it make money on the, in the cinema? Yeah, made $500 million. Oh, wow, well, there it is. Yeah. Can you get it on iTunes now? Yeah, you can get you, it well, anywhere how? you want. Now you can get it. Now you can. Yeah. You have a, a lead of, what, 13 weeks? Or yeah, there, there was, uh, in certain territories, 12 weeks. In certain territories, 14 weeks. All right. Does um, that answer the Nick. question? Yes. Kind of. There was an interesting, just quickly, there was an interesting uh, um, uh, research, bit of research done, that showed that if you released everything at the same time, for most films, 80% of people would still go to the cinema to see them. So you're not going to have that big a drop-off in cinema. 
And then it's usually people who've seen it in the cinema who then buy the DVD. So I don't think that the business is going to be as threatened as some people think. Nick, we've got to squeeze in three or four okay, no, very quickly. This was just a comment, really, on the first question. Uh, you were asked about <coughs> uh, defining uh, success, a uh, film that's going to succeed. And I wanted to point that person, the first question there, um, in the direction of a book called Adventures in the Screen Trade by w William Goldman. Because I think even though it was written a long time ago, it still holds good today how extraordinary it is. And he told uh, the story of Michael Fagan who broke into Buckingham Palace and all the things that happened and it couldn't possibly succeed. And yet it did. And the, how they, the making of Butch Cassidy. And they said that nobody wanted Westerns anymore. It's a very interesting book. I think. And people want to know what, what ingredients the answer is, you, can, you can't really tell, can you? Mm. Um, no, but as he said in that book, the most famous line, which I think is beginning and end, um, you probably remember it better than I, I think it was, nobody knows anything. Isn't that the right line? Yeah. Um, and he's absolutely right to this day, and that's why I kind of said that ultimately, you can never always be right. If someone who tells you they're always right is wrong. Uh, <laughs> um, but... In terms of then and now, there has been a big difference. And, and then was 70s, was it? 80s, when he was writing? You know, now, now we have so much more stats and comps and statistics and comparisons. <laughs> and, you know, we understand how the market operates in a much more sophisticated way. I mean, in those days, it must have been brilliant to be a studio executive because you just read a script and you went, I like it. And then you made it. You, nobody sat down and did the numbers. I run computer models on every film I make before I make it. You know, they never did that. And the films were better, I think. All right, uh, uh, Chinese gentleman. Um, hello there. Um, uh, firstly, just want to say that uh, my girlfriend and I both enjoyed your films very much. And it, it's a little bit different from those action movie blockbusters. There's a little sparkle in your movies. Um, we do enjoy it very much. Good. I just Thank want to you. say that in person. Thank you. Um, my question is that um, I'm going to um, Columbia Business School. I'm going to do MBA there uh, coming up. And I've got a little project that I want to do. Uh, is it, nowadays in business, it's all about big data, where you have a massive future of data and you do an analysis to it. Mm. You dive into it. And I kind of want to do it for movies. Um, Excellent. Somebody needs to, because we do not use our big data in the way we ought to. Okay. Nobody is dealing with that issue. Yeah, that, that was my question. I, I don't know, because my cousin told me that you guys already do those uh, sophisticated modelings, yeah. et cetera, et cetera. But we don't collect the data we should. We have hundreds of millions of people globally seeing our movies. We don't know who they are. We don't know anything about them. We, we're just chucking it all away. And it's not a job I can do, but if you can do it, I'll be thrilled. All right, well, there it is. You've got a bright future. Now, mm. pass the mic back to the uh, <laughs> um, woman in the back. Yes, yes. And remember this session when you become a famous statistician. Yeah, come back and show me how to use What's your name? Bo. Good luck, Bo. Good, good, Bo. <laughs> Go on, question. Okay. It is Second interesting. last question. It was very interesting to hear you talk about uh, movies that travel, and of course yours have traveled exceedingly well. But there are very few Chinese movies that manage to travel over to the West, and those that do invariably get classified as art house movies, and they get screened only in these rather peripheral venues. Hopefully with the recent um, uh, co-production treaty that, that's been signed between Britain and China, that we're going to see more of a two-way flow between these two countries. But in your opinion, what is it about Chinese films that don't quite make it in the West? Is it, is it's, the it's very cultural? Easy. It's very easy to answer the question. Sorry to cut you short, but he's taught me that I have to. Um, it's something called language. Um, the only reason I'm successful is because I was lucky enough to be born in a country where we speak English. And it's a brutal truth that if I'd been born in France or in Germany or in China, or it would be way harder to build a working title films. We would have been able to build a company that did really well indigenous, indigenously and traveled within our own country. But 
audiences are lazy and audiences they go with what they hear is good or you know and the audiences that aren't lazy are the art house ones the specialized ones the thinkers like all of you you know who want to be challenged and that's why you will see chinese films french films german films italian films only in limited um, uh, theaters and limited in in dvd store and limited on itunes um, unless you make uh, Crouching Tiger, which then can be sold as an action movie, or um, you know the French Last Emperor, L Last epic. Emperor, which is sold as a huge epic. Um, but I think without Bertolucci, I don't think that film would have been as important as it was. The same film had been made by Chinese, um, and the French just recently made this film, uh, Untouchable. I don't know if any of you saw it. Unbelievable film, really great, tiny little film. You know, and it did hundreds of millions of dollars in Germany, in, in France, in Italy, in um, Holland, in Spain. I think it did $300 million, which for a tiny French film is unheard of. In America, zero. In England, zero. We are the worst people in the world, the English and the Americans, in terms of we like it when it's spoken in our language. And then we export it. It's cultural imperialism. Okay, well, tell world. our Chinese producers to tick to make films with Chinese actors but speaking or, or, English. Or, or genre films like Crouching Tiger. And then, but I have the same problem. I, my interesting films, I can't get seen wide either. All right, last, last question. I'm afraid it's, it's coming up to, to some. Yeah. Thank you. You mentioned in the very beginning, in the first few sentences, that as a producer, your main thing was kind of putting the money together and the financing. Uh, how has that changed over the number of years? Because now I'm, I, I read that a couple of actors also kind of take a share of the revenues instead of taking upfront fee. Is that true? And, and connecting that with the director question, between the producer and the director, who's the boss? Well, obviously the producer. <laughs> um, uh, the boss, you know, I don't know what, what business are you in? What business are you in? Finance, okay. So, you, but then you probably heard this expression, managing creative talent. I'm sure it comes up all the time in your, uh, your uh, private equity or whatever it is you do. Um, so that's what I do. I have to manage creative talent. And managing creative talent, the minute you, you can't say I'm your boss because that's it, the relationship's over at that point. Well, so I think his question, uh, was, there's one that's, uh, the main part of the question was, how, do you now encourage or not, or discourage actors to say, okay, can I now, rather than getting a fee, get a cut? I mean, do you entertain actors or participants in a film getting hand, their hands on the equity? Of the yeah, film? yeah, yeah. I'll do any deal that works for the project. So there are no rules. Um, you know, I've just done a film with an actor and a director where none of us took any money out of the budget, zero, and we all took a piece of the back end, and then and we worked it in a very idiosyncratic way, and that was the only way to get the film made. Plus, I think if it works, it'll be more profitable for other people. Um, there's an example recently, I'm trying to think which one it was. There was a big, a huge American film where uh, the actor and the director um, would have had what we call gross, which is a share of the revenue, regardless of profit, okay? And that's a traditional thing for certain people of a certain level um, that they can get. The studio wouldn't make the film giving them gross and chose to give them a huge piece of the back end once it hit break even. The film then went on to way overperform and they made three times as much money from the new deal than they would have done from their last deal. So, you know, you just gotta try and make sure you're on the right side of the equation at, at all times. As we are in the dream world of film, what the other... Um, no, I, I wouldn't bother. It, wouldn't it, it'll bother. look rubbish on that. All right, okay. Let's just end it. All right, well, we'll just entertain one last question. And in, in, right, I think I have to choose between the bearded man and the beautiful lady here. So It's quickly. the bearded man. <laughs> <laughs> it's the bearded man. <laughs> All right, quickly, we'll have two more, and then we're going to go, Eric, go. Just going through that showreel earlier, so many of those films are now sort of part of the culture, really, you know, Four Weddings and About a Boy and uh, Love Actually, all that sort of thing. And talking as well about the way that these films get made and the process that leads up to you know, them actually appearing in the cinema. I wanted to know whether there are any of those famous hits that have come within a whisker of not being made. 
did, did four weddings almost fall at some hurdle, or, or is there anything like that that's happened? Um, a lot of them have come within a whisker of failure. Um, so I'm not going to name them because uh, it's unfair on, the, on the, uh, the filmmakers. But there are a couple of our huge hits that when we've, what we do is we, sh we, we put the film together, we shoot it, and then we do, um, uh, okay. there'll be a first assembly, which is when all the material gets put together and you see roughly what you've got. And then you spend 12 weeks honing it into a great film. Usually at the assembly stage, you know what you've got. There are two of our biggest hits at the assembly stage, I wanted to just burn it. It was the, by that bad. And so it's really interesting how powerful editing is, how you can really, and we, we get very, very involved in the edit with all of our filmmakers. And you can really, you know, we did a film called Senna. I don't know if anyone saw Senna, the documentary. That, that was a tiny little project. It was budgeted to have probably 12 weeks in the cutting room. We spent a year and a half in the cutting room. Because I just was not, I, I wasn't happy. You know, my main contribution, you know, Asif and James and Manish were brilliant on the creative. My contribution was refusing to allow them to stop, which is rare for a producer because a producer usually is worried about the money and wants them to stop. I would not let them stop because I didn't think the film had got there yet. Didn't think it was good enough. Didn't think it was good enough. Didn't think it was good enough. And we edited for a year and a half. And so it was the editing which actually perfected it. Yeah, editing is what on, on that So one. on the failure Edit. front is the, is the hurdle of the, of the editing. However, However, I know you want me to shut up. No, However, I don't want you to there is an expression in China, which That's David all. Tang has told me many times, which is you cannot polish a turd. <laughs> um, <and laughs> you're absolutely right, especially <laughs> so from it some people I know. Editing, if, if, if what you've shot is inherently bad, you can edit for 20 years and you'll still have a bad film. H have you actually made films where you've just dumped them because they are turds? No, David. <laughs> <laughs> All right, la very last question. How do you react and strategize against moments out of your control, for example, with Everest and what's going on in Nepal at the moment? Well, if my office had done their job properly and transferred the correct trailer with all of the effects and everything, you would have seen there is a card on the end which, um, which refers to the Nepal Relief Fund and uh, shows that we at Working Title and everyone at Universal have made donations to that fund. And we give a link on the card to other people and hope that they will, like us, contribute and start supporting the, the, the people in Nepal for the tragedy that's happened. So you have to react. You know, if we'd been, you know, I hate to say this because the tragedy is the worst thing, but in terms of a bit of business, if you open a film about Everest the weekend that there's an earthquake on Everest, your film's going to do no business. Um, so this isn't available yet. I just wanted to show you guys it's not out there yet. Um, our film is coming out in September, October. Um, but yeah, you. Do you work in the industry? Yeah, okay. You're absolutely right. You have to be ready and swift footed. There was a, uh, when the, the, the power cuts and the storms happened in New York a couple of years ago, there was a film opening, and they would have spent their $35, $40 million worth of marketing. And it was an action movie about America going into meltdown because of storms and electrical power cuts and, you know, blah, blah, blah. It was a genre movie. Nobody went. You know, and by all accounts, a good movie. And they just got unlucky. After three years of working on this thing, they opened it on the weekend that no one's got any interest. Will you please join me very warmly to thank Eric Fellner for coming today. Thank you. Thank you.